Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Justyna Zajons. Uh, I'm director of Polish Studies Center, Hamilton Lugar School of Global and International Studies here at Indiana University Bloomington. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you on the 10th Timothy Wiles Memorial Lecture, the flagship annual event uh, of the Polish Studies Center. I'm especially thrilled that we are joined today by our distinguished guest by Anne Applebaum, a Pulitzer Prize-winning historian, journalist, and commentator on the current global developments. Anne Applebaum is an expert on European history and politics, a staff writer at the Atlantic, a senior fellow at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the Agora Institute. Among uh, the books that an uh, Applebaum published uh, is uh, Red Famine, Stalin's War on Ukraine, Iron Curtain, The Crashing of Eastern Europe, 1944-1956, and Gulag, A History, that is a winner book of the Pulitzer Prize for General Nonfiction and the Dove Cooper Prize. The last book uh, of an Applebaum is uh, Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism, and this book explores the vast question of why liberal democracy is under siege. Very recently, uh, Ms. Applebaum has been named of uh, the top 50 thinkers of the COVID-19 age by Prospect Magazine. So here we are with a special guest on a special occasion and in a special place. And I'm also pleased to say that uh, Lee Feinstein, the former US ambassador to Poland and the founding dean of the Hamilton Lugar School of Global and International Studies kindly agreed to say a few words about the importance of all three, about our guest, our occasion, and the place. So uh, thank you, Lee, and over to you. Thank you very much, Justyna. Uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with both of you. Uh, uh, many of you uh, are already familiar with uh, uh, Justyna's work. She has a joint appointment uh, at Indiana University as a professor of international studies uh, and also in the political science department and is the director of the Polish Studies Center, which is part of the Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies. Justin is a tremendous asset to uh, HLS and to Indiana University. And in addition to her expertise in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, she's also an expert on the European Union uh, and on transatlantic relations. And she's been a go-to person for uh, us on campus about the, uh, about the ways to understand the significance of uh, uh, the war against Ukraine. Let me just say a, a word or two about the Wiles lecture, and then just a personal anecdote about um, Anne Applebaum um, so that we can uh, leave uh, time for uh, her presentation and your uh, questions. Uh, just uh, to say that um, uh, this is the premier lecture of the Polish Studies Center. Uh, it celebrates the memory and accomplishments of Timothy Wiles, who received his doctorate from Stanford in 1975 and joined IU in 1973 and was a fixture of IU for 30 years. He uh, first uh, uh, grew fascinated by Polish culture after spending a year in Poland in 1971 where he directed plays at an international student theater festival in Wrocław. Uh, and his uh, uh, UChicago book, The Theater Event, Modern Theories of Performance, remains a major uh, study of the th theories of modern drama and theater. And um, he uh, established the close contacts between IU and the American Studies Center at Warsaw University. He actually helped to establish the American Studies Center which opened in 1976. And I can tell you that to this day, many of the most talented officers at the US Embassy in Warsaw are graduates of the American Studies Center there. Uh, I had the great privilege as did uh, my wife Elaine, who's a professor in the media school to get to know um, uh, Anne uh, while we were in Warsaw. Um, Anne was then and is now a, a, a voice against authoritarianism and for democratic ideals. She is rigorous in her research and independent in her views. And she studied this stuff when lots of people forgot about it before it became cool again. 
and that's a sign of her uh, independence and also uh, foresight. We were talking before when we were um, guests of um, Anne uh, and her husband in Chobielin of a sign outside, uh, and I'll just summarize it as a communist-free zone, no communists, like a no smoking sign or a no nuke sign. Uh, and uh, our son, who at the time uh, would have been about seven or eight years old, said, hey, dad, what's a communist? Uh, and in a way, that's what uh, Anne Applebaum has been doing with her work, reminding us, even when people thought that the problem was solved, what a communist was and how the world needed to react and be prepared to defend democracy. With that, I'll uh, turn the floor back over uh, to our convener, uh, Dr. Zayots. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lee, for your nice uh, introduction and for your kind words. Uh, so before I will ask the first question to Anne, uh, let me briefly describe the format of our event, how we are going to proceed. So we would really like to focus on those issues that are the most uh, interesting and there are the special interest to our audience. Therefore, uh, it's not going to be a traditional lecture, but we rather organize this webinar in the format of discussion, questions, and answers. So, and here I'm speaking to our audience, please write your questions in the Q&A, and I will be happy to pass your questions uh, on your behalf to our guest. Uh, and our webinar will uh, take uh, now 15 minutes, so we have time until 4 p.m. Without further ado, and Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. I'm happy that you are with us. I know that you have a very busy schedule and you've just uh, returned from Ukraine uh, where you interviewed President Zelensky. You visited suburbs of Kiev, uh, including Bucha, Hostomel, Irpin. So let me begin with the general question. What struck you the most when you were in Ukraine almost two months after the Russia invasion. So thank you so much, Justina. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, I'm very happy to be joining this seminar virtually, if not, you know, not in real life. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be in touch with you all, even if, even if virtually. Um, I should say that the sign Lee describes that was on our house, we have a house outside of Warsaw for a long time, um, was eventually taken down partly because nobody got the joke anymore. Um, it, was a, it was a sort of ironic reference to signs that used to be in London about nuclear free zones. And we realized that no one got any of the references. So we, we took it down. And so yes, time changes and it becomes important to re-explain to new generations um, what happened in the past. Um, I should have, before I start and answer Eustina's question, one tiny caveat, which is that uh, this is not a TV program and it is possible that someone will ring my doorbell during this conversation, in which case I will run downstairs and let them in. They were supposed to get here beforehand, but they didn't. So I'm just warning you all that that may not happen. This is real life and not um, not a recording. Um, as for Kiev, um, so we did go, I, I, I went, um, I guess it's about 10 days ago now with my editor, Jeff Goldberg. It was one of the reasons why this seminar was postponed. It was meant to have been during that, during that period. Um, of course, for me, I was last in Kiev in December and to go back now, uh, at that time, six weeks into the war was very striking. I mean, Kiev is a, um, is a very different city from what it was. Um, in some ways, of course, it's surprisingly normal. The traffic lights work and the subway works and you know, the supermarkets in the center of town have food in them. It's not a, it's not a wasteland, but the, the mood of everybody is radically changed and the focus is on um, protecting the state and, and you know, it's, a, it's a question of ex existence and survival. Um, and I think if I was gonna try and transmit one thing that's really important about this war, that may be hard for outsiders to understand, and this actually relates to the history of communism, is that the Ukrainians have understood that this really is an existential war. This is not a battle over some territory. It's not just about you know, where the border of Ukraine and Russia is gonna be. Um, 
we went, as Houston has said, we went to uh, some of the northern suburbs, which had been occupied by Russian troops for several weeks, and we saw the kind of destruction that was left. I mean, really, almost every house destroyed. And these are very ordinary places. They're, you know, they're 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 just little bedroom communities outside of Kiev. They have little small houses, and they have a few apartment blocks. There's nothing special about them, but they were almost totally wiped out. There was no, there are no military reason to wipe them out. There's no um, logistical reason to wipe them out. They were wiped out because the Russians who arrived there understood that their job was to do so. The idea was to eliminate Ukrainians, to erase them um, from those communities and to, to make either kill everyone or force them to leave. Um, and of course they, they were totally deserted. They are not inhabited now. Um, the same thing, of course, is happening in eastern Ukraine. Every little piece of territory that the Russian troops take over is um, it's occupied. The leaders, especially the local mayors who are all democratically elected in that part of Ukraine, as in all of Ukraine, um, the, the, the democratically elected leaders, the heads of the city organizations, sometimes heads of police. I read about one museum director who was arrested. Anybody who had some kind of influential um, or leadership position is arrested, murdered, sometimes disappeared. We don't know what's happened to them. Um, random violence is then used on the rest of the civilian population. And flags are taken down, Ukrainian flags are taken down and replaced. Actually, we've seen in the last few days that in some cases they're replaced not with Russian flags, but with Soviet flags. Um, uh, you know, perhaps this is a gesture, you know, some kind of attempt to create some kind of nostalgia, which I think will fail. I don't think anybody in that part of the world has nostalgia for the Soviet Union, or perhaps it's just to show it's an illustration of fact that the Russian flag, you know, what does is, what is Russia stand for now? Russia stands for nihilism, murder, um, you know, an empty and cynical society. Um, you know, the Soviet flag might even have more meaning still for some of the troops who are using it. But what, what that tactic is, that kind of destruction of, of infrastructure, both human and physical, um, that's a tactic that we know from the past. That's what the Red Army did when it invaded um, Eastern Poland and the Baltic states in 1939, 1940. Um, that's what the Red Army did when it came back through Central and Eastern Europe uh, after the Second World War, you know, when they arrived in, in, in Poland. Uh, in, in 1944, they created a, a kind of fake government in the city of Lublin. They declared a Lublin government. They used at that time local Polish collaborators. Um, but it's very much like what the Russians do when they arrive in the city of Kherson, for example, and they say we're going to create an independent republic of Kherson, even though the local public population doesn't support it. So this, they create fake states, they eradicate the existing administration, and they murder a lot of people. Um, and they create corpses and they create refugees. And as the Ukrainians have understood that this is the nature of the war, um, this has changed both the way that they fight and also um, has made their argument to the West and to the outside world, it's not just to the West, it's to the, to the entire world, especially the democratic world, um, more poignant. Um, they are saying, and, and the President Zelensky, whom we did met, says this very clearly, you know, this is an exterminationist war. It's not just about us. It's about eradicating anything that still remains of a liberal world order or the values of human rights um, or the rules that were set up by the UN after the Second World War. It's about undermining any basis of, of respect for sovereignty, of respect for, um, you know, respect for the right to life, for humans to live, um, and of respect for borders. Um, and so it's not just an assault on Ukraine as a nation, it's an assault on a whole system of values. Um, and the Ukrainians understand that. And President Zelensky is, is increasingly good at explaining that and at telling, you know, explaining that when he speaks to foreign parliaments and foreign leaders. Um, and so, I mean, the, the, the impression that you have after visiting Kiev is both that this is a deadly serious war it's not just about Ukraine and Russia. It has a universal international significance. The Ukrainians understand that and the Russians understand that. Um, and it's incumbent upon us to understand it as well and to make sure that the, the values of sheer violence, um, the, the genocidal intention and language that the Russians are using um, and the, the, you know, the belief that they can wipe a country off the map with no consequences 
it's important that we make sure those ideas don't survive this war. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to also ask you, um, you mentioned the West. How do you assess the West action after the Russia invasion? So from one side, there was this, uh, I would say, unprecedented um, behavior of the European Union. The economic sanctions were imposed. There is the financial aid for the Ukrainian. There is the military uh, add from the US and from the European Union to Ukraine. But from the other side, and this is what you clearly stated also in the in the article in the, the Atlantic, what the President Zelensky said, that nothing happening fast enough and weapons are not arriving fast enough. So do you think that the West, the NATO, US reacted properly or should have been done maybe more? So there have been several phases in, in terms of the West's perception of this war and particularly the military establishment's perception of the war. Um, before it happened and in the first 48 hours, um, many people in Washington, maybe the majority of people, believed that it was going to be over very fast. In other words, they'd seen the Russian battle plans. They knew that the Russian idea was to be in Kiev within three days and to occupy the, 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 the capital immediately and then after that to to, to occupy the whole country. Um, and they thought there was a chance that Russia might succeed in this. And so, um, although there was some military aid to Ukraine in the run-up to the war, and um, it wasn't on a large, you know, on a, on, on a scale, anything like that was necessary, but that was partly because there wasn't a great belief that the Ukrainians would, would win. Nobody was really sure how the Ukrainian army would fight. Um, some of that was, you know, just lack of experience. You know, the United States hasn't worked with Ukraine for decades the way it's worked with some other allies. You know, it's not Great Britain. Um, you know, it's not France. It's not, it's not a country that we have deep and long association with. Um, and some of that was actually the effect of um, experts in Washington who spend a lot of time reading Russian military doctrine and listening to what Russian, you know, generals are saying and who came to believe it. Um, and so partly there was this lack of faith in the beginning. Then we were then there was a kind of long second phase. And I think our trip to Kiev was at the end of that phase um, in which the West, the US in particular, but also the UK, France and, and other countries had understood that they needed to step up and they had begun delivering weapons at a, on a greater scale. But most of what they were delivering was still kind of tactical weapons, small scale weapons, um, things that you know, that that weren't, um, you know, they weren't long range artillery, they weren't planes, they weren't tanks. Um, it seems to me, and this is just based on an impression and on a few conversations I've had in Washington in the last week, that there has been a further shift. And whereas the very beginning, they thought Ukraine would lose right away. In the second phase, they thought, okay, the Ukrainians are doing better than we thought, but we still don't see how, you know, how they can win. We're now in a third phase when people in Washington have begun to believe that the Ukrainians can win. And by win, I mean ex not just hold the line, but expel the Russians from the territory they've occupied since February the 24th. Um, and they're now beginning to act on that. Um, you know, there was a, there was a, there is, as Zelensky himself described, there is a kind of disconnect between the way people feel in Kiev, where everything's happening all at once. Everybody's on a 24 hour a day schedule. Everybody's fighting the war all the time. Um, and Washington, D.C., where people work nine to five and they go home on the weekends um, and where, you know, the Pentagon has rules about how, you know, I don't know how you get this piece of equipment out of storage and, you know, what's the proper procedure for doing that. And, the, you know, Congress you know, has to has to agree to the budget and, the, you know, there's a kind of process. Um, and so there was a, there was that that disconnect. My sense is that some of that is is improving. I mean, there's a there's also a there's a there's a there's an it's not an oddity, but it's an interesting point about this conflict, which is I, I have been asking people and I can't find anyone who can think of a recent precedent for this kind of American military aid. So you have to go back to the Berlin airlift, you know, maybe, um, you know, or maybe the, the, the aid that we gave the UK, the land lease program. Um, it, you know, just during the Second World War, the first part of the Second World War, before the U.S. entered it, we were helping the U.K. with equipment. Um, and that's about the most recent, <laughs> the most recent example of us, to this extent, helping another country fight a war. And so some of, some of that, I, you know, the Ukrainians tend to sometimes 
got suspicious. They thought, you know, they don't want us to win or they're not, they don't really believe in us or they, you know, there's some maybe pro-Russian people in Washington. Really, I think a lot of it was just the U.S. adjusting to the pace of a completely different kind of new operation. Um, uh, that isn't to say that there aren't some people in Washington who wish we weren't doing this. I'm sure they're there. Um, right now, they're not winning the argument, but the, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be around and they'll be back. But, but as I said, my sense is that as of the last literally few days, heavier equipment has begun to arrive, especially this long range artillery that the Ukrainians can use to defend against the much larger Russian army that has now gathered in Donbass. Yeah, and speaking about the United States that uh, really helped the Ukraine, but also Joe Biden visited uh, Warsaw, he visited the other European countries. I would like to ask you also more from the Polish uh, angle and the Polish perspective. Uh, how do you see that the, real, the, the war in Ukraine uh, impacted the Polish-American relations? Uh, Especially at the beginning of the Biden presidency, they were might not be very warm. How how do they? So so yes, I mean, this is this is complicated, and I don't want to say anything too definitive because it seems to be in flux. This um, the the current Polish government is a would be autocratic government. I mean, it is a government that's pushed back against um, the independent judiciary in Poland. Um, they have, in, in all kinds of different ways, sought to curb the influence of independent media. Um, they've taken over state media, which is supposed to be public media, you know, unbalanced and with reflecting both sides of the political argument. And they've made it into kind of party political propaganda of a very, very virulent kind. It's sort of hard to describe if you're not in Poland, but you have to, whatever's the most extreme far left or far right magazine you have ever seen, that's what Polish state television is now like. And that's what a lot of the population watches um, and doesn't have access to anything else. Um, and so it, they, they had taken a, a number of steps down the road towards Orbanism or even towards Putinism, if you want to describe it as that. And one of the effects of that was that they um, they had sought um, approval for this set of policies from the Trump administration, which they got. Um, and when Biden was elected, they initially said, um, you know, they because they they follow you know right wing media in the United States, they didn't believe in the election. They didn't, you know, they they ha you know waited a long time before offering congratulations because they followed this line of you know the election has been stolen and now Trump will win in some other way. So they you know so they. And because of that, there was no early phone call between Biden and the Polish president, um, Andrzej Duda. And I'm not even sure when they did finally speak, but it wasn't in the first months of the of the Biden administration. And there was a lot of feeling in Washington that Poland has gone too far um, and so on. There was also an incident um, just for some background where the Polish government tried to take off the air, um, to put it sort of somewhat crudely, but tried to take off the air the one really powerful independent television station in Poland, which happens to be American owned. Um, it's owned by the Discovery Channel. Um, this didn't happen partly because of the US Embassy pushed back very hard in Warsaw, um, partly because the president of Poland, I think, decided he didn't want to pick that fight with the US. And so fortunately, as we were going into this war, um, we didn't have an ongoing, you know, open battle between Poland and the United States about freedom of the press. Um, but but there but we came close to it. Um, since the war began, um, I think the the government was very disoriented in the first few days and was very silent. But partly because of the outpouring of popular enthusiasm for helping the Ukrainians, including this incredible grassroots project to accept refugees. Almost all of the refugees who are now in Poland are living in people's houses. Um, you know, and that was all organized by NGOs and, and charities in Poland, um, much less by the state, although cities are, are playing an important role in that too. Um, and also the fact that the, you know, the Poles immediately empathized with the situation. It reminded them, Polish viewers of this lecture will know, it reminded them of 1939 um, when Poland was attacked and nobody helped. And so they thought, right, we're gonna help. Um, and there was an enormous amount of enthusiasm for the Ukrainian thaws and the government now reflects that and amplifies it uh, and so on. And that of course means that, um, you, you know, the, for the first time this Polish government is, you know, pro-American or pro-Biden. 
um, it means that they are uh, they've somewhat toned down their rhetoric against the European Union, although not entirely. Um, you know, but they have you know they seem to have pulled back into the Western camp in some ways, and they've also um, broken or 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 lightened, I suppose, their relationship with Viktor Orban, um, who is the other. Um, who's the other, you know, would be autocrat, or really, he's really is an autocrat by now in the region and who has been much more openly pro-Russian um, than the Poles would like to be. So they, you know, they've gone sort of halfway back. I mean, they have a, they have a obviously now a very important military relationship with the United States. We have more American troops in Poland now than there ever have been. Um, in fact, I think if, if to my recollection and, you know, maybe Justyna, you or others on the call will tell me if they don't, if they remember otherwise, but I think it's the first time like in modern history that any ally has come to the defense of Poland during a military conflict or in advance of a military conflict. I mean, I, I can't, you know, you have to go back to like Grunwald or something, you know, when you think of, you think of other times when Poland fought with allies or had allies helping them with an invader. And so it's a very, very important military relationship. The arms for Ukraine are going, some of them, quite a lot of them are going through Poland. Humanitarian aid is going through Poland. Um, Rzeszów, which was a fairly obscure town, you know, in Eastern Poland by the border is now, I haven't been there yet, although I'm supposed to go, but is now a kind of booming, I don't know, um, you know, it's a place where they're full of journalists and U.S. senators are there and, and you know, this place where all kinds of aid is coming in and out. So there is a it's it's an incredibly important relationship. Um, I don't think that all of the cracks are healed and I don't know what will happen when the war is over. But I, I do think and hope that the war has caused a lot of people in Poland to rethink um, their belief that Poland doesn't need allies, that Poland doesn't need to be part of the West. Um, that Poland doesn't need Western institutions because when push comes to shove, it turned out to be really important that Poland was still perceived as a Western country and was still perceived as a country within the sphere of the democratic world because that's why uh, that's that's part of why the United States is um, you know is is so heavily involved in defending Poland. Uh, but I, I tried to give a this is a this is a university seminar and not a television program, so I've tried to give a nuanced answer. I hope that's useful, but I'm happy to answer other questions if people would like. Yes, so I have the question from the from the audience, so I will like uh, you know connect some questions. Uh, it's about the uh, impact of the war on the Polish internal politics. Uh, as you say, especially considering the possibility of the snap elections uh, before the summer. Uh, and also about the internal politics, I see the question, what uh, challenges do you see um, coming for Poland uh, with the refugees? So there is almost like 3 million refugees in Poland. How can you, how, how this, uh, this developments, they can impact the internal politics of Poland? How do you see that? So the re the refugee story is a is a very new one, and I'm hesitant to make predictions. Um, as I said, the 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 initial reaction was overwhelmingly positive. Um, I actually had until a couple of weeks ago, I had nine Ukrainians staying at my house in Poland. Um, they've now moved on to Germany because they found some kind of arrangement where they can set up a Ukrainian school. Um, but I may have some more coming. But almost everybody I know. Um, also has refugees either in their spare room or in a, you know, in an, in an empty apartment they own or have some, you know, every, everybody I know has, has tried to do something. And if they can't personally do something, then they've donated money. Um, so it's an enormous grassroots um, effort. Um, I think it's part of it, as I said, it's about sympathy and empathy. It's also because this wave of refugees is almost entirely women, children, and old people. Um, and I think that creates a different atmosphere. I mean, this is just how human beings are. The, you know, the sense is that these are genuine victims and we need to help. And there's very little, I mean, maybe some on the fringes, there's very little suspicion, you know, that they're here to steal our jobs or whatever it is that makes people paranoid about other kinds of refugee waves. Um, and, so, and so there has been, as, as I said, until now, this, this, this outpouring of, of sympathy. Um, I do worry about what will happen over six months, um, over a year, um, if the war isn't solved. I mean, you can already see, you know, in the little tiny, 
you know, pro-Russian and the somewhat less tiny far right political movements in Poland, you can hear people saying, you know, we've, there was somebody a couple of days ago, you know, they're going to depolonize us. You know, why do we need all these Ukrainians? Um, invariably, there's going to be an economic issue. Um, just that number of people way on, you know, adding to the Polish healthcare system, adding to the Polish school system. Um, you know, the, the mayor of Warsaw said a few, you know, a few days ago, you know, we, we now have another 100,000 children in the Polish, in the Warsaw school system alone. Um, and there are children who don't speak Polish. Um, and so they have to be somehow accommodated and dealt with. And how that's going to happen is, you know, anybody's guess. Um, so there is a, um, there is the possibility that down the road, people will become more disillusioned or more angry, um, especially as, you know, inflation is quite high now in Poland. Um, oil and gas prices are high and probably going to get higher. Uh, and so, so it, sorry, hold on just one second. No, sorry. Sorry, that was my guest. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, so, so I, I am worried about how this will um, how this will play out down the road. I mean, there is a there is a there is a there is a chance it could go bad. For the moment, that's not the case. But you you can you can imagine um, you you can imagine a backlash, and you can imagine how there would be groups interested in creating a backlash. You know, there's always a the there's it's always useful to have a you know a group that everybody hates. <laughs> Um, for some kinds of politicians, it's very useful to have an enemy. Um, and they, you know, the Ukrainian refugees at some point might become that. That's not true right now, but we could get there. Yeah, it's very difficult to predict uh, the, the, the things uh, change very fast, but still I have a question that I would like to uh, also ask uh, on behalf of our audience. Uh, Hiroyaki Kuromiya, if I pronounce well, uh, is asking, uh, about also it's about the prediction so this war is continuation of the war that began by russia in 2014 how do you think is the war likely to end if ukraine beats back russia in eastern ukraine will it try to recover the donbas lands controlled by russia the donetsk luhansk people's republics and what about the crimea so i i don't know right now what the end game is like and i don't think anybody really knows yet um you know, it's sort of an, it sounds like a cliche and it is, or it's sort of a truism. I mean, it depends on what happens. Um, one of the reasons why it's so important for the US to continue arming Ukraine, not just the US, but other Europeans and, and others as well, is that a lot will depend on how the fighting goes and where the final line of contact is. Um, if the Ukrainians are able to push the Russians back, um, you know, to, at least to where they were on February the 24th, there will be a different kind of conversation than if it turns out they are not able to do that and the Russians are able to occupy more territory in Eastern Ukraine. So there will just be a different kind of conversation and a different kind of negotiation. And so, because I don't know the answer to that yet, um, I can't tell you. I mean, I know that the Ukrainians are looking for and hoping that there will be some kind of longer term solution. So there will be, whether it's a US security guarantee, whether it's um, some kind of long-term penalties on Russia, whether it's some kind of deal that the sanctions will remain in place until X, Y, or Z is done, um, I don't know, but they want something more than just, okay, everybody stop fighting, put their arms down and let's have another frozen conflict. Um, they're hoping for something more than that. Um, but as I said, until the, until the Ru essentially until the Russians stop fighting or until they give up, you know, they announce that they're not going to keep going, um, you know, then it's very hard to say what that's going to look like. Um, but, you know, do the Ukrainians want to take back the Donbass? Yes, of course they do. Um, I think Crimea is more difficult just te technically and for other reasons. Um, but they would, um, you know, that, you know, if it turned into a route and the Russians began retreating, then yes, I think that would be possible. I mean, much also depends on what happens in Moscow and what happens in Kiev. Um, will the Russians, not just the Russian public, but the Russian elite continue to support this war? Um, 
I don't know, uh, will, um, you know, will Zelensky be able to hold the, this kind of, you know, I mean, all political groupings and parties in Ukraine are now absolutely unified behind him. Will he be able to hold that? Um, remember that one important political issue to consider is that for him to give up any territory, maybe even including Crimea, to give up anything or, or trade something would be unbelievably unpopular. You know, so he's, he, it's not just that, you know, he, of course he doesn't want to trade away any territory because he knows what will happen to the people who live in it. But more than that, um, he would find it politically impossible. There, you know, there's nobody in Ukraine who wants to trade away anything. Um, and again, not just because, you know, they, you know, they're picky about their borders or they need this, the, the line to go through this field and not that field, but because they understand the Russian occupation to mean, you know, death, destruction, mass violence and rape. Um, and so he has no, he has no support for that kind of negotiation. Uh, so, so I would, I would keep those things in mind while, while watching this play out. But I, I think predicting how that will end before we have the end to the military conflict is difficult. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, here the question also from Adelaida Bonk about the land lease. Is there anything that you could add talking about the land lease uh, that you mentioned at the beginning uh, of your of your talk? Uh, this help for the Ukraine from the US and the other. No, 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 no. Land, land lease was help for the United Kingdom for Great Britain yeah. from the US during the Second World War. Yes. So in the, in the first part of the world, when the British were fighting and we were not. Um, we we gave them military equipment and uh, you know trucks and, and and things like that. And that, as I said, I only mentioned it because that's the last time that you know that the U.S. aided another country that was fighting a war on such a large scale. Um, actually, at that time, we gave um, there was equipment that went to Russia as well. Um, you, it, I, I even found it in the in the research I did on my book about the Gulag. There's at some point in the early 1940s. Studebaker trucks start showing up in Siberia, and that's part of the land lease, lend lease, not land lease, lend lease um, program uh, that that the U.S. was offering allies who were fighting Germany. Um, so, 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 so that's the last time it happened. And you know, now we're you know fast forward to the present. We're trying something that is pretty unprecedented in modern times. There's no there's no exact parallel to what we're doing now in terms of helping another country. There's been some smaller versions of this. Some people have mentioned South Vietnam, um, but I don't think it was on this kind of scale. And talking also about the escalation of the conflict uh, and the military escalation, uh, the question from the Professor Bill Sherman, uh, who asked, uh, Putin has toyed, at least rhetorically, with the deployment of nuclear weapons. How seriously should we take his threats? This is a very difficult question, also hard for me to answer since I don't read Putin's mind. Um, there was a lot, I'd say about three or four weeks ago in Washington, there was a huge panic about nuclear weapons that Putin might be really getting ready to use them. There was a lot of nuclear talk on Russian television. I mean, I think since the Russians withdrew from Northern Ukraine, proving in fact that they can withdraw and they can change their war aims and that this wasn't some kind of you know, we are going to rush for Kiev or else we're going to nuke Kiev. Um, there's been a little bit of it's toned down a little bit. Um, but yes, I mean, I think the Ukrainians fear it. The Americans fear it and the Europeans fear that um, if Putin is really losing, he might try it. I mean, the question is what purpose it would have. Um, if the purpose of, you know, launching a nuclear weapon in Ukraine was to scare the Ukrainians, it might backfire. Um, um, it, it, first of all, it might create an even greater anger and desire to, um, to, to resist, which is, um, which is what Russian atrocities have done so far. Um, second of all, it would, it would make it very difficult, for example, for China or for any of Russia's other allies to continue to go along with them. It would, it would be a real breaking of a taboo. Um, and it would, I think, turn Russia into a genuine pariah state, not just one that's isolated by the West, but one that the rest of the world is, um, is, is very wary of. Um, so, so although I, I, I don't want to discount the possibility, I mean, it's certainly true that the Russians have in their military doctrine um, the idea that they could use tactical nuclear weapons. They do practice it. They exercise it when they do military exercises. They practice 
whatever it is, you know, putting the bomb on the plane and flying the plane in the air or however it is they would, however it is they would deploy them. Um, they, they practice it, they've talked about it. They've also talked about setting off a nuclear weapon like in the Arctic or in the air or over the Baltic Sea as a warning sign. You know, sometimes they've exercised doing that as well. So that's another possibility. They would first try to scare everybody before using it in reality. Um, but but um, you know, as I said, the, since, since the withdrawal um, from the area around Kiev, it seems a little bit less likely to me than it did or a little bit more um, well, a little bit less likely to me than it did three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Also, talking about the the escalation and the, this, what is what what we are saying, and what was in the in your article in the in the Atlantic, that the, this conflict can be deadlier than anything that we've seen so far. I want to ask you about the uh, diplomatic solution. Also, what. I was uh, surprised when reading your article and the interview with uh, with President Zelensky that there was no mention about negotiation, peace talks, diplomacy, diplomatic solution. What do you think is the chance for this diplomatic solution now? So, so really, as I said, it's the same as the question about the end game. Until the fighting stops, there's no diplomatic solution. Um, I think some thought a little bit earlier in the war, there might have been something, you know, the Ukrainians would say they were neutral or something, you know, there would be some exchange. But um, but the, the problem is that the Ukrainians don't really believe the Russians. So they think that the Russians use diplomacy as a way of, um, you know, kind of prolonging the, the conversation while they prepare for the second wave of fighting. Um, they, the Ukrainians think that the Russians have been shown bad faith in their negotiating. The negotiators who show up to meet them, they've met them in Turkey, they've met them in Belarus. Um, and the negotiators who come don't seem to be equipped with any authority to do anything. Um, and so they, they think it's bad faith. They don't believe that it's a real negotiation designed to end the war. They think it's just part of the, you know, this bigger, bigger game. Um, eventually, of course, there will be a negotiation, um, but that will happen once the Russians have decided to stop fighting um, and they have not decided that yet. Do you think it will be more like bilateral or there will be the mediator? And if so, mediator, who could be? Is the other state or any international? Well, there, there's, there are lots of people who are trying to be mediators right now. I mean, the, the, the Turkish president. Um, uh, Roman Abramovich, one of the Ukrainian, I mean, sorry, Russian oligarchs, um, has, has been in Kiev recently, actually. Um, the Israelis offered to be mediators because they have, you know, the, Israel is a country that has connections to both Russia and Ukraine with uh, immigrants, um, who, you know, who come from those countries, including some who are members of this U Israeli cabinet. So there have been a, lots of people willing to negotiate. And of course, I think any if there's to be any lasting solution, yes, it will have to include the United States, Europe, um, you know, maybe China, maybe others, uh, you know, as a way of, as a guarantor of the, you know, whatever, whatever border is drawn at the end of this conflict. Um, um, but the problem isn't the lack of mediators. The problem isn't that we're, you know, that there are, isn't anybody willing to do it. The problem is that the Russians are not willing to stop until they've gained territory or they've solidified their hold or whatever, whatever it is they've decided their military goal is. Um, and so until, until the Russians stop fighting, until the Ukrainians win, essentially, by throwing them out of the country, um, I don't think there's, I don't think there's a really much negotiation time. There are some talks happening. Um, there, there are actually are exchanges of POWs and prisoners. Uh, there is some communication between the two sides, but but the the real negotiation won't happen until the fighting is over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and let me go back a little bit to the Polish uh, and Ukrainian relations. I have a couple questions here regarding the relations between Poles and Ukrainians, and we know that history was not uh, always easy between those two. How do you think the the war? now that this invasion of, of Russia can impact Polish-Ukrainian uh, cultural memory and also, you know, the, the re resurgence of rebirth of the nationalistic uh, approach from the two sides. There is 
how do you see this that can can happen? So that that's that's a great question. I mean, I you know again, this is we've only we're only two months into this war and two months into the Polish experience of hosting two million Ukrainians, and so it's hard for me to say exactly how it will develop. I mean, it has to be said that until 2015, relations between Poland and Ukraine, including both at the political level and at the cultural level, were pretty good. I mean, maybe better than ever before in history. It was a Polish president, Alexander Kraszewski, who was the first um, Western leader to recognize independent Ukraine. Um, it was a Polish government. It was Donald Tusk's government, in which my husband was the foreign minister in, I should say, um, that led the, the created the idea that um, Ukraine should have a relationship with the European Union that launched this idea of a trade deal. It was called the European Partnership. Um, uh, you know, so there was a there was a deep and 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 you know very important political relationship. At the same time, you know, I'm aware of several projects between Polish and Ukrainian historians to write joint histories together. Um, there were several projects that looked at you know difficult moments in the Polish Ukrainian past. I mean, some of some again, some of those listening will know that there were. Um, atrocities committed during the Second World War, Ukrainians mass murdering Poles, um, you know, and some Poles, long tradition of Poles um, being seen as oppressors in Ukraine, particularly in, in the interwar period when Poland ruled what's now Western Ukraine. Um, and so there are a lot of bad memories um, and a lot of effort was made to, if not eradicate them, then at least to deal with them and talk about them at the level of historians and people who build monuments and um, take care of cemeteries and so on. And there was a there was an enormous back and forth and and an attempt to get, you know, clarity or at least some agreement about facts. Um, since 2015, the, the, the peace government in Poland is much more um, nationalist and uses, you know, has been not has been willing to use this kind of anti Ukrainian language at times. Um, a lot more anti-Ukrainian rhetoric and slogans appeared in Polish media in the last several years than had done before. Um, I don't know whether some of that may have been um, Russian inspired and some of it was native. <laughs> um, but the, the, the also the presence of Ukrainian uh, workers in Poland, which went up in the last few years, created some um, clashes as well, and you know, particularly in the in in eastern Poland, there was the beginnings of some kind of anti-Ukrainian feeling and movement. Um, my, again, my hope is that the nature of the war will show Poles and Ukrainians alike that they live in the same geopolitical space, they have similar enemies, um, and that the solutions for both of them, if they want to be safe, is to work together and to have a close partnership. Um, that's what I hope will happen. I can't. I can't guarantee that that will. That's that's what will happen. Um, and I should say the same. You have some of the same. You know, some of the same attitudes in Ukraine as well. I mean, there was some. You know, there's there's anti-Polish feeling there connected to Ukrainian nationalism that also appears. Um, I got a little of it when I, I wrote a book about Ukraine that was published in Ukrainian a few years ago. It's a book about the Ukrainian famine, and it's some of the public events. I got a little bit of pushback about Poles and Poland and so on. Um, so that that's there too, and again, it's my hope that this um, this feeling of you know mutual dependence will end some of that, or at least encourage people to talk about it, the past in a in an open and um, you know intelligent way. Mm -hmm. uh, and another question is about also the unity of the West, because uh, the fact that the West reacted really all together uh, for for for, uh, for Russia invasion. From the other side, the internal problems within the West, they didn't disappear. The question is, how do you think uh, the West can maintain the unity and for how long? And we're talking about the European Union countries, we are talking about the United States or so transatlantic unity. For how long it will be able to to keep this unity? So, so um, a lot depends on who are the leaders of the West. Um, we are fortunate that the French have just re-elected Emmanuel Macron, um, who I believe will wants to has an idea of France as a leading country within a Western you know, European alliance, um, and he will continue to support Ukraine. Um, had his opponent won, it might have been more difficult. Um, she, Marine Le Pen was a had been funded in the past by Russia. She actually got more recently funding from Viktor Orban. 
Um, and she ha is somebody who has a long history of being both pro-Russian and anti-American and anti-NATO and anti-European as well. Um, so a lot depends on who the leaders are. Um, you know, the key country to watch, as I'm sure everybody knows, is Germany. Um, Germany did experience a kind of shock when the war began. Nobody in Germany had believed it would happen. Um, everybody, you know, German leaders for a decade have been saying, you know, we believe in dialogue. We believe that we can create a relationship with Russia based on trade and common interests. And I think there was a, this was a real shock to the system. Um, I, I even think for ordinary Germans who aren't much interested in Russia or Ukraine at all, just the sight of tanks rolling across Europe again gave people the chills. And there was this immediate reaction that Germany needs to change its policy. It needs to back Ukraine. It needs to, you know, begin the much, much different and much more serious defense spending. It, I think uh, the Chancellor Olaf Scholz had a comment about, you know, Germany needs planes that fly and tanks that roll and we can't have this dysfunctional army anymore. Um, so there was a there was an important shock. I mean, the question now is how that's interpreted that goes on into the future. So there are already different voices in Germany, people saying, you know, we want peace. We don't, you know, we, we can't fund Ukraine because then that just keeps the war going. There's been a lot of German reluctance to give Ukraine heavy weapons. Um, and, you know, the way in which that debate plays itself out will also affect other European countries. But I think for the moment, I think for the coming months, weeks and months, um, there is a pretty solid coalition. Um, most Western countries are led by people who were genuinely shocked by the invasion and do see it as a threat to themselves, you know, to, to their own nations in some ways. And so I'm not worried about the alliance in the short term, but in the longer term, both changes of leadership, um, the, the economic cost of the war, um, the influence of, um, you know, Russian-backed groups on the far right and the far left, I think could could begin to break it down. Let you know. My hope is that um, the war ends in some way before that happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. So, talking also about France, probably we should look on the parliamentary elections that will be in June. Uh, so it will tell us uh, more what will happening. But I have also uh, several questions about the atro atrocities, Russian atrocities in in uh, in Ukraine. Do you perceive those horrible crimes in Ukraine as a continuation of Holomodor and the genocide in, in Ukraine that was in the past? I'm not sure I would say that it's a continuation um, because there has been a long break in between, um, but it's certainly a return to old ways of, of thinking and doing uh, and behaving. Um, you know, the, the kind of propaganda state that Putin has created is increasingly reminiscent of Stalin's propaganda state. The language that's used about Ukraine, you know, that it's not a real country, these aren't real people, they're Nazis, you know, he actually undermines and, you know, twists the, the, the word Nazi. Um, they're not human is really very reminiscent of the language that was used about the kulaks or the Ukrainians in the past. You know, they're not real, they don't deserve to live, they're, they're blocking our progress. Um, they're standing in the way of history. Um, those, those, that kind of language has repeated itself before. And then, as I said, the behavior of the Russian army in Ukrainian territory is so reminiscent of Red Army behavior that it it's, can't be an accident. Um, there's clearly a Red Army playbook. There's a, a set of practices from the past. They've been taught again to a new generation of soldiers. Um, you know, the, um, you know, the NKVD doesn't exist anymore. It's called something else now. But the the, the, the way of this man, method of behavior is, is so familiar and so exactly similar that there is continuity. Um, so there is a, I think what we're seeing is the Russian state studying its own history or rather its history as a part of the Soviet Union and reviving old practices to use again. Mm -hmm. and, and it will be probably one of the last questions because we are, <laughs> we are running all the time. What do you think we can do as all of us? Uh, you know, the, the President Zelensky also mentioned like, uh, if Ukraine is to have a secure future, the Russian information barrier will have to be broken. Is there anything that we, all of us, we can do in this uh, for helping? I, I've, I've talked to a lot of people about that in the last few weeks. Um, there's no, kind of obvious answer. There are people doing things. Um, there is a, 
Um, there is actually a website called callrussia.org. If you speak Russian, there they will give you a list of phone numbers. You can try ringing people in, in Russia and talking to them. Apparently, this has mixed success. I tried sending some text messages actually, but didn't get a um, I didn't get much response. Um, and there there are projects to call and text Russians. The Ukrainians have tried that as well, and they have a similar project to call and text Belarusians which was apparently more successful. Um, and so there is a kind of people to people attempt to reach people inside um, in, inside the country. There's also um, there's, a you know, there's there is still independent Russian media that is producing material. Um, it was either Media Zone or Medusa. There were there were there was some amazing one of the best um, investigations of what happened in Bucha, the, 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 the town north of Kiev was conducted by Russian independent media. And one of the best interviews that's been done with Zelensky was done with independent Russian journalists. So they're still operating. And if you have access to a VPN or you're a sophisticated user of the internet in Russia, you can read it. Um, so there is a there is a attempt to reach people. There is still Russian language reporting going on um, how to break the Russian internet firewall and how to get ordinary Russians, for example, to watch satellite television where there's also um, Russian language programming, some put together by Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, um, some by others is is a, is a harder task. But um, I don't I mean, ordinary people can contribute. You can try you can try making those phone calls yourself um, or you can, you know, subscribe to and contribute to the really good independent Russian media that's out there. Um, and as well as continuing to support Ukrainian media, some of which also broadcasts and 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 produces material in Russian. And I think that we could continue this conversation for a very long time. Uh, however, we are <laughs> run of time. So I want to thank you very, very much. Uh, and I'm absolutely sure that our discussion will inspire many of us the look of uh, what is and what will be happening in, in Ukraine with a very fresh insight. So I am very grateful and we are grateful in the Polish Study Center. So I appreciate your time very much. Uh, I also want to thank our virtual audience uh, and for the great contribution, for the great questions. I hope this you see for the other events that organized by the Polish Study Center. So again, thank you very much. and. And goodbye. Hope to see you on the other occasion. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure and greetings to you all.